was very impressed by that and I was thinking how can I use this also in, uh, in changing uh, companies, changing organizational behavior. Organizational behavior is the biggest uh, section of the uh, Academy of Management and uh, but uh, how can you change that behavior and how can you pinpoint that behavior. This is very well studied in clinical psychology, in families, in uh, individuals. And uh, so that was my idea. I studied also uh, uh, industrial psychology, organizational psychology. How can I uh, generalize the knowledge of clinical to industrial psychology? And I was looking for literature about that. And there was uh, some literature in America. And the one name that came up most, uh, most often was that of Bobby Daniels. And, uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> so I, was, I wanted to know him, I wanted to get into uh, his literature first and uh, went to America to, uh, to see him. He immediately uh, offered me uh, courses for free because he knows about positive reinforcement. That's the basics of uh, behavior analysis. In Holland we don't know a lot about the science of behavior analysis. And that is the science that, uh, on which that family therapy was based on. And upon uh, which is improving uh, sport performances, whatever behavior you have, you can increase that behavior if you want that behavior uh, with behavior analysis. It's based on uh, Pavlov. And uh, well, uh, finally, uh, uh, I had a presentation in November about how I try to market uh, behavior analysis and, and uh, the application in organizations, organizational behavior management in Holland. And to my surprise, uh, Aubrey said, uh, well, you are busy there in Holland. I am curious what you are doing there. And yeah, I want to come to Holland. And so I was very uh, flattered by that uh, gesture. And I thought I must make the best of it. And we has uh, a stage for the whole week here in Holland. Uh, the next days, we will have uh, all kinds of conferences and uh, seminars uh, for professionals. But this day, we focus on academia, about how can behavior analysis help you in your research and in pinpointing behaviors, in improving behaviors, in assessing behaviors. And this is what we are going to talk about and now, what Audrey will talk about uh, now with you. And uh, of course he will give them uh, first an introduction about himself, uh, how it started. Uh, but I think there will be a lot of questions uh, from you. And uh, so you can uh, have the best uh, out of this meeting for yourself. So this is the great man, Paul Daniels. <laughs> Applause. Thank you. Oh, that's good. They can't say that to themselves unless I've said it to them, right? Or somebody said it to them. So we go outside, inside, not inside, outside. So I'm not directing myself, but I'm just. Are you being directed? Guided yes. by that's right. Yes. That's right. And, and see, it's like if you want to change your behavior, the best advice I can give you is to change your environment. And see, if you look at, for example, which we have in terms of uh, uh, prisoners, people who are in, incarcerated for some crime, the big majority of them create, commit a crime the day they get out. The very day they get out. Because what do they do? Where do they go? To the same environment that produced the behavior in the first place. So, the way we talk about intrinsic reinforcement is that it's reinforcement that does not require the presence of another person. And you see, there's so many people that think that when they read about uh, positive reinforcement, that that's the sum and substance of it. No. There are more consequences than positive reinforcement. And it's a time and a place for all of us, actually. But, but the fact about it is that um, if, if I understand that my behavior is being controlled, if you will, by the external environment, then I either accept that or I fight it. Well, you know, you can fight it all you want to, but if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of of uh, uh, free will and that kind of thing. I mean, we could talk about that uh, if we had time to go into that. But, but the idea is that you're freest when you have multiple responses, multiple responses for any given situation. 
that companies haven't been able to keep up. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a book by uh, Chris Judson called The Innovative University, and he's predicting the downfall of universities. He's saying Harvard, who, which has a, an endowment of like, what, $200 billion? He says, they are so big and so encumbered by policies, pre procedures, and so on, that they cannot turn the ship around quickly enough to be overtaken by the small. And he, uh, you know, to go to Harvard probably costs $60,000 a year. There's a college, it's a, um, a Mormon school that, that was taken, bought by uh, BYU, Brigham Young University, where you get a four-year degree for $8,000. What they've done is they have, I noticed this morning, there are lots of rooms that are locked by are empty. But if you go to this college, and I guess in Idaho, uh, they're always full. You know, if they have two or three people in a class, well, they don't teach that class anymore. You know, but they want to make sure that all the classrooms are utilized, you know, so we've got an investment here, they're all utilized. And they, they've done a lot of uh, stuff like that. They, every, 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 a student has to have at least one online course every, every semester. But they've done a number of things. They looked at the cost is too much. You know. I was on the board at Furman University with, where I went to school. And uh, every year, I mean, every year, we'd sit around and talk about how much we're going to increase tuition. I don't think it ever occurred to anybody, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can we not find a better way to do this so we can decrease it? I mean, it's, it's ungodly how much it costs in the United States to go to school. I mean, it's like Furman University, which is a small, little large school, is forty-seven thousand dollars a year. You know, who can afford that? Well, apparently, enough to keep it going. There's kind of a point where you know, the, the, as you can see, you plot the lines in terms of the uh, subsidizing education, which they have to see. This is what I was saying. The model is broken. I mean, it's a wrong model. Because we have them subsidized, if we don't have enough people to give money back to the university, we can't we can't live. So no student is paying their full amount. Even even if they pay the forty-seven thousand dollars, it costs more than forty-seven thousand dollars to teach you. Well, nobody ever says, "Well, can we do this more efficiently, more effectively?" I think we got to, or something's going to happen. You know, uh, there was a um, an online course that was taught. One university taught it on, it was on creativity, actually. Two people that scored at the top of the, it wasn't a class, it was a class, but scored the highest, were hired by group, six figures. Neither one, had, neither one of them had a college degree. So, you know, it, it, the competition is beginning, you know, to occur on all fronts and say, we've got to do something. And I think we've got to do something. Not something that's going to evolve slowly. It's, it's something that's going to happen fast. Because uh, we have ways to teach faster than we can transfer knowledge. Faster than we can. I think the problem is because we haven't identified, and all the time I was a trustee, nobody could tell me how, what was the advantage of Furman at, uh, you know, like $200 or more thousand dollars to teach them over a public school where they could go for a half a party. What's the economic advantage then? What do they learn? They say, well, we can't, we can't pinpoint exactly what it is we're trying to do. So the future of educational institutions? It's, it's, it's in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, like uh, uh, technology. If you look at uh, the rate of technology is increasing, I went to Singularity University. Have you heard of uh, Ray Kurzweil, Peter Diamandis? Peter Diamandis wrote a book called Abundance. It was fairly popular. Uh, Kurzweil's have not been all that popular because they're about this thick. Books are about this thick. But uh, they, they are described as futurists. They talk a lot about what's going to happen in the future. Now, Kurzweil has been particularly effective because 
92% uh, of all his predictions, and he gives a timeline, he says, by the year of this year, this, these things will happen. And 92% uh, of them have already, I mean, so 100 and some have passed, and he's been right at 92%. And he wants to argue about the other 8%. He said, well, they all know that. <laughs> but he's, he's accurate in doing this. And what he's talking about is the rate of change. And the singularity university is basically named a physical term called singularity, but, but it's basically, they, they said, the singularity is the point at which um, computers will outpace humans in terms of being able to think problem solve. And he says that will occur in the next 15 years. Now, if you look at the rate of change, this, this technology, In other words, uh, it was years ago called Moore's Law. You probably familiar with Moore's Law. Talks about uh, computer power, and computer power was doubling every two years. Then it was 18 months. Now it's less than a year. So most of our customers cannot relate to this because what they're doing is they're setting goals on uh, a uh, on a menu. Let's, if we can improve, if I could go to any customer in Holland or the United States and say, we will guarantee you a 20% improvement in productivity, quality, whatever, for the next five years, compounded, or your money back, I mean, you think we would want to sign up. But see, that's all this kind of When the world is moving this way. Now, the problem is that change in the beginning is incremental. I remember we were working in uh, uh, all the business in, in the United States when the Japanese first started. And I can remember managing to say how much market share they have. And of course it's less than 1%. And so they were bothered. That's because they were here, but they were on this curve. And they were here on this curve. And, call it. and so, so many of our customers are right now beginning, we're trying to alert them to this, that there is a there's a, an inflection point at which the other curve will overtake you. And so if you think about this, uh, Uh, Google has a, uh, a driverless car, right? Well, before it's even been made public, two or three other manufacturers are starting the business, right? They're getting in. But if you have a Google car, can you have a Google truck? In the United States, it's very hard to get a driver a truck because they have to work weekends, they work away from home, they're gone all the time. And so they have to give them all these benefits and things, and, and they advertise all the time because they, people 